plant creatures, the leafy, rooty, viney, thorny, mossy, sappy monsters of Dungeons and Dragons. They are not the most prominent creature type, nothing compared to things like undead, monstrosities, humanoids, but there are some iconic plants that occupy a unique and important place in the game. But are any of them any good? Do they have interesting combat abilities and other features? Do they have engrossing lore and inspiring adventure hooks? Do they engage the characters? Do they provoke decision-making points? Do they have interesting and effective styles and aesthetics? These questions and more are the kinds of things that I'm after. If we look into the background of plant monsters, we find quickly this is not a typical type of creature in mythology, religion, and folklore. Sure, there are lots of mythic plants, but plant creatures are another thing altogether. There are various cultures that have old tales of man-eating plants, which could serve as a generalized inspiration for the plant monsters of modern day media and games. There are also plant spirits and tree spirits and such from early animistic religions, but it's not so easy to think of them as plant creatures. For example, the Kodama from Japanese Shinto are spirits that inhabit trees, or sometimes the term is used to refer to the tree that is inhabited by spirits. But again, these aren't really plant creatures, rather they're supernatural or ghostly things that dwell inside of plants. Another reference sort of along these lines would be the dryads from ancient Greek mythology, also known as tree nymphs or oak nymphs. While they are spiritually connected to trees and they are embodiments of the essence of the woodland, they are really depicted as human-like maidens. D&D categorizes dryads as fae, after all. Turning to nature for plant monster inspiration, there of course is no shortage of plants found all over the earth that can stab, scratch, and poison. And let's not forget about actual carnivorous plants, though they are so small that they only eat tiny critters. Much like what we saw with the oozes, when it came to the 20th century, there was an explosion of genre fiction, first in books, comics, and magazines, then in movies. This caused an absolute mad rush to create all kinds of different creatures for the burgeoning tales of adventure, horror, fantasy, and sci-fi. Probably the most well-known plant monster from film is Audrey II from Little Shop of Horrors. But there are some others which had their own varying degrees of success. Even the original The Thing movie from 1952 featured a plant-based alien life form that could take on a humanoid-like form though the John Carpenter version from 1982 is vastly superior and also closer to the original short story Who Goes There with what is clearly an aberration monster. All of these cultural phenomena went on to influence gaming, which brings us here to this analysis of the plant creatures from D&D. So get out your scimitars, axes, and fire spells. It's time to hack and burn our way through this hellacious jungle and figure out what is just overgrowth and what is fearfully ferocious flora. Starting off F tier is the Thorn Slinger, a creature from the Hidden Shrine of Tomoakan adventure in the anthology book Tales from the Yawning Portal. The Thorn Slinger has no lore, so I won't be able to talk much about this creature. It is a thorn, shrub looking plant creature with highly sticky blossoms growing on it. It attacks in melee and at a range with thorns, and it adheres to anything that touches it. The stats describe how to resolve a creature that is stuck to the plant, but not an object. If you strike this creature with a sword, the wording indicates that your sword will get stuck. How do you try to get your sword back? As a DM, I could pretty easily come up with something like opposed strength checks or a contest of skills or whatnot, but it's quite odd that the creature's ability does not provide any standard rule for this. Other than a couple decent abilities, the Thornslinger has nothing going for it. It's basically just a stat block. Our next F tier creature is the Shrieker, which really is not bad per se, but it is so limited. It really shouldn't be classified as a creature, but rather just a fungus. 
It cannot move. It has no attacks. It doesn't really do anything but grow there. It's a human-sized mushroom that emits a loud sound when creatures or bright light come near it. It does hold a niche in a cavernous or underdark ecosystem, as monsters use it to become aware of approaching creatures or interlopers. So in this way, I'm glad that we have the Shrieker around, but if I had been the designer, I would have made a bigger section in the Dungeon Master's Guide about plants, fungi, and other kinds of non-creature things and their effects, terrain hazards, and other challenges of that sort. Slightly higher up is the Violet Fungus, another creature here that is barely a creature at all. Really, it's just a plant. Well, really, it's a fungus. Fungus and plants are entirely different things. Yeah, whatever. So, like many creatures in this running, the Violet Fungus is incredibly slow, with a snail-like speed of 5 feet. All characters can easily outrun it, outdistance it. The most likely scenario is that a character will stumble upon the Violet Fungus unknowingly as he tromps through patches of underdark fungus growths or even a mushroom forest. When the Violet Fungus strikes, its number of attacks are determined randomly with a D4 roll, and each hit deals 1d8 necrotic damage as the purple stock appendages rot flesh away upon touching. A chance to deal up to 4d8 necrotic damage on a CR 1 4th monster is quite extreme, though it's also pretty situational. What are the odds of that happening? Getting into D tier now, we come across the Tri-Flower Frond from Tomb of Annihilation. I really like the general concept of this creature, a human-sized plant with three trumpet-shaped flowers, an orange, a yellow, and a red, which each presents a different kind of attack. But unfortunately, this monster suffers from two major issues. One, it is not properly designed, and two, it has no lore. We could also levy a criticism that its simple plant nature makes it barely even a creature, has no personality, no goals, no dynamics, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. There are some really cool creatures that are nearly mindless. The design problems are a double-edged sword. You see, when the tri-flower frond attacks, it uses three flowers in a certain order. First is the orange blossom, which if the target fails the constitution saving throw, it's poisoned for one hour and unconscious while poisoned in this way. The target makes a new con save to overcome the poison once every minute not at the end of each of its turns. This is exceptionally punishing for 5e standards. It feels like something from an older edition. You will have a very hard time finding any other monsters that operate this way. Now you can make an argument that 5e goes too easy with the saves at the end of each of your turns, that mechanic, but that's a whole other discussion and really does not justify this one obscure plant monster doing something more powerful than even demon lords and ancient dragons. The second blossom, the yellow one, has the target make a dexterity saving throw, and on a failure, it is coated with an acidic sap that deals 5 acid damage at the start of each of the target's turns. The only way to get this sap off is to douse the target with water. Otherwise, it lasts forever. That's right, it has no natural expiration. And guess what? If the target failed the save against the poison on that first flower and went unconscious, it's now going to automatically fail the deck save on the second flower. I cannot think of any ongoing damage in 5th edition that literally never stops and can never be stopped unless you douse the target with water. The third blossom is the red one, which is an attack roll that does a mere 1d4 piercing damage and grapples the target. While grappled, the target takes 2d4 poison damage at the start of each of its turns. You know, to go along with the forever acid. These mechanics just needed a solid revision to bring them in line with the design standards of 5e and the power level of a mere CR 1 half monster, because they are just crazy. And if we combine that craziness with the fact that this creature has no lore, it just exists because, and who knows what the heck it even is, that is a recipe for low tier. Sure, there is the other side of the coin that I alluded to just a bit ago, uh, in that this monster will get a kind of infamy, and maybe shock and terrify the players. 
But that shouldn't be because the design is wonky, rather that the design is very effective. The only silver lining in this case for me is that after reviewing a thousand and one 5e monsters that are underpowered, it does amuse me to see one that is overpowered. And now, the Compestry. Compestry? Not sure on the pronunciation there. No, we have not suddenly slipped into reviewing My Little Pony or the Smurfs or Super Mario Brothers, but a cutesy little cartoon mushroom from the Wild Beyond the Witchlight module of D&D. So, to put it lightly, this creature is not my cup of tea for tabletop role-playing. Uh, keep in mind that the creature speaks in a nasal falsetto voice. And it can only talk using mimicry! Imitating words and sounds it's already heard! Uh, I, I, I have to work on that. Its speed is a mere five feet, which is as slow as it gets without having no speed at all. It attacks by headbutting, and once per day it can release spores that incapacitate and slow for up to one minute. The Compestry come in individual and swarm varieties. They are happy-go-lucky goofballs who love music and will sing and cavort and emulate any music, even bad music. It's something of a joke how they wail together off-key. Personally, I'm a big music lover. It means a lot to me and always impacts most of my creative projects. So. Someone who frolics about unaware that they're listening to or producing crap music is not exactly appealing. A final note worth mentioning about the Compestry is that its illustration depicts it as an Amanita muscaria type mushroom, which is probably the most utilized look for a mushroom in art and pop culture. Curiously, this kind of mushroom is poisonous and psychoactive as its toxins induce altered states and hallucinations. Humans in parts of Siberia and Northern Europe have a long history with this mushroom, which has in many cases served a role in shamanic and spiritual practices. There's something really deep that could be tapped into with this type of creature, but in true pop style, all that gets ignored in favor of silly shenanigans and cheap gimmicks. Let's just move on. Next is the Quagoth Spore Servant. A Spore Servant is actually a template that can be put onto many different types of creatures. Basically any living flesh and blood creature that was slain then reanimated by a Myconid Sovereign's animating spores. More on that in just a bit. The template is honestly quite a boring one and it strips the base creature of about everything. In a way, the spore servants are the plant equivalent of a zombie. The example entry shown in the monster manual is that of a quagoth, and it is a boring bag of hit points with just a basic attack. So much of the very limited space in the myconids section got taken up by this template. The designers should have given it some kind of interesting quality or ability, but they didn't. Bleh. The man trap is a large sized plant monster that, like many on this list, is more plant than creature. Once per day it can release a 30 foot radius area of pollen that allures creatures to it. Once a target does come close, it entraps it in a sort of a maw of giant leaves. The engulfed creature is blinded and restrained, and it takes ongoing acid damage as the man trap is digesting it. The subject can attempt to attack the man trap from within and essentially the only way to free the engulfed creature is by killing the man trap. This is a fairly simple creature with only some bare bones lore, but it does have a certain stylishness to it, a kind of classic plant monster from an exotic adventure location, and its abilities are quite memorable and effective for what they are. Like many of the creatures in this ranking, it has an abysmal speed, so the vast majority of encounters will involve the characters keeping their distance and destroying it at a range, as it will be unable to ever reach them after its initial ambush. Shambling into mid-D tier is a classic D&D plant monster, the Shambling Mound. These walking compost piles spontaneously animate when either lightning or powerful fey magic infuse a heap of plant matter. The Shambler then plods about, or swims even, 
looking to consume any creatures it can, living or dead. In a way, it's reminiscent of an ooze. It's a fairly simple, big, dumb, brute creature. And if both of its slam attacks hit the same creature, it can then engulf the target, which is a nasty and rather perilous situation to be in. The creature within gets restrained, blinded, is suffocating, and being crushed to death. Unlike many plant creatures, the Shambling Mound resists fire and cold damage. And not only is it immune to lightning, but it's actually healed by it. Like I mentioned with the black pudding in the Ooze's ranking, an awesome encounter idea would be to ally the Shambling Mound with an NPC who casts lightning bolts, or some other creature that deals area of effect lightning damage, so it could simultaneously assault the characters and heal the Shambler. There could even be a Flesh Golem in the mix as well for some extra challenge, as it's also healed by lightning. Like most plant monsters, the Shambling Mound has some major limitations that hold it back from reaching into higher tiers. But nonetheless, it is a great low tier monster and one of the most iconic plants from D&D. Creeping along, we find the Yellow Musk Creeper, one of the plant monsters from the Tomb of Annihilation module, along with the Tri-Flower Frond and the Man Trap we just looked at. This campaign has the characters exploring a lush jungle region, so it is good that the designers included some new plant creatures. Well, what happened to you, Yellow Musk Creeper? You went from this to this. From huge size to medium, from damaging intelligence scores and eating brains to um, not doing that. This pernicious puffing plant of peril is known for attracting humanoids through its strong musk that imposes a charmed condition. It's very much like the harpy song in that the charmed creature spends its turns moving as close as possible to the creeper, though also like the harpy, the DC is low, it's only 11. A humanoid slain by a yellow musk creeper becomes a zombie ally of the plant, specifically a yellow musk zombie. What is the difference between the yellow musk zombie and a regular zombie, you ask? Well, my brave companions, the standard zombie's undead fortitude is negated when it's killed by a critical hit or radiant damage. The yellow musk zombie's undead fortitude is negated when killed by a critical hit or fire damage. Ha ha, it's different. Uh, this monster was a terror from the 3E fiend folio, but now it is a smaller, weaker thing and has a downgraded art style. I suppose it's still quite good for a mid D tier entry, but if I were to feature the yellow musk creeper in a game that I ran, I would rather adapt it from the previous version instead. Next up, we have the simple awakened shrub and awakened tree. The monster manual says simply that it is an ordinary shrub or tree that is given sentience through magic, such as the awaken spell. Both of these living plant creatures have an intelligence score of 10, which is higher than many player characters, especially in 5e. They also have a wisdom of 10, though only a charisma of six, and they speak one language known by the creator. Their lore is skimpy, their abilities are incredibly simple just with a basic attack and the ability to appear as a regular shrub or regular tree. Really it's the intelligence and burgeoning personality that makes these creatures kind of cool. They're held back from high and even mid tiers due to their major limitations, but as far as D tier monsters go, these are nice. They're good baseline plant creatures with nothing glaring or annoying about them. They also serve as a nice base to build on top of, as these sapient speaking plants could learn new abilities, or even in special cases, gain class levels. Floating at the top of D tier is the Gas Spore, a rather unique creature in D&D. Like what I said about the Shrieker before, it is debatable if we should actually consider this a full-on creature, or rather just a fungus. But there's a decent case that you can make that the gas spore is a creature, since it can actually move around and does have an attack. A gas spore grows from the corpse of a creature, and the original gas spores spawned from dead beholders. 
It takes the form of a beholder, though if you inspect it up close, it's obviously made from fungal matter, not flesh and blood or whatever the hell beholders are made out of. Its stalks can touch prey to deliver a deadly disease, and if it is damaged, it bursts, releasing a 20-foot radius cloud of poison damage that also delivers the same disease. Believe it or not, despite this creature being a mere CR one half, the disease's DC is 15 and its effects are that the infected subject dies in a number of hours equal to 1d12 plus its constitution score. For the second half of the disease, the host also suffers the poison condition. After the infected creature dies, 2d4 tiny gas spores arise from its corpse and they grow to full size within a week. I have to applaud the gas spore. Rarely do 5e creatures have that deadly of effects. This is surprisingly lethal, as there is no way to overcome the disease non-magically. So you need someone in the party who can cast Lesser Restoration, or a Paladin who can use Lay on Hands, or perhaps the group can reach a healer that's capable of removing disease. Honestly, diseases in 5e were handled so poorly, and it's a shame, because they were done rather well in 4e. Personally, I have a house rule that requires the healer to make a spellcasting ability check when they attempt to cure diseases, poisons, curses, and the like. Otherwise, baseline 5e just sweeps all diseases and curses under the same rug with simple spells that don't care if the affliction was caused by a CR 1 half fungus creature or a CR 24 demon lord. A final note worth mentioning about the gas spore is that the noxious spores it releases can carry memories from the original beholder that spawned its fungal lineage. A character who is afflicted by the spores but cured before dying retains these impressions, which could provide important information or perhaps seed a strange character development arc in which a beholder-touched mind influences the character. That brings us to the end of D-tier. Many of the plant creatures are in this tier and C tier, though there are some that are higher up too. So far I'm liking the plants overall, despite their limitations. A few of them have been just annoying though, or maybe too lacking in their designs, but that's not an issue exclusive to plants. Before we get any farther through this jungle expedition, I want to take a quick moment to mention my new Kickstarter, Labyrinthine Gardens. This is a way for me to run a D&D &D game for you all, for my whole channel to experience and contribute together. The format is a unique one. It doesn't have any distractions. It's just pure focus and art and gaming. Backing the Kickstarter gets you a big D&D &D adventure module that you can run either for a whole party or just a single character. And at the same time, your support also funds the new adventure experience on YouTube. So I can DM not just for a few players, but for all you guys. It's distinctly different from anything else out there. As much as I enjoy ranking and analyzing the various options in D&D, what I like even more is actually creating and telling a story. I encourage you to back Labyrinthine Gardens on Kickstarter. This is about a new dose of inspiration, something with a unique style, with grit, with an emphasis on storytelling, and a sense of the mystical. There are links in the video description below and at the end of the video. Starting off C tier is the Vegapygmy, a mold creature with a roughly humanoid shaped body. Their name is somewhat misleading as they are not actual vegetable creatures. Technically they're not plants either, but fungus. I'm not a big fan of the look of this creature. I think it goes too far into the silly look, but it isn't the worst in this area, so I'll spare it my verbal scourging. The Vegapygmy actually gets a half page of lore, which is more than some monsters have. They are associated with russet mold, a dangerous type of fungus that grows on metal and can be mistaken for rust. Creatures that die from the toxic spores of russet mold end up spawning Vegapygmies from their corpses. The origin of Vegapygmies is debated, with some sources claiming adventurers discovered them along with russet mold in a remote metal dungeon that held bizarre and rare life forms. Other sources say russet mold and Vegapygmies first came from a fallen star. I wonder if this was supposed to mean meteorite? 
as a blazing ball of fire would not support the mold or the vegapygmies. In fact, fire and bright sunlight destroys them both. Whatever the case, vegapygmies are a simple life form, not very bright, but intelligent enough to form a kind of crude language composed of hissing and bodily gestures. They dwell in dark, moist, warm areas, either underground or in dense forests where sunlight does not pass through the canopy. They possess little to no technology and just wield their natural claws or maybe some simple weapons that they manage to scavenge. They camouflage readily among plant life and they have a natural regeneration which makes them nearly impossible to kill without cold, fire, or necrotic damage. There are two variants of the Vegapygmy. One is called Thorny, which has a spiky body, is medium-sized and a bit more animalistic, both in its body shape and intelligence level. The other is the Vegapygmy Chief, which is essentially a stronger kind of the baseline Vegapygmy that it can also release a burst of spores once per day. The spores deal poison damage, inflict the poison condition, and if they slay the creature, its corpse spawns one or more new Vegapygmies, depending on its size. All in all, the Vegapygmy is not a bad monster, but not a great one either. Next up is the Twig Blight, which belongs to the Blights, a kind of corrupt plant creature that gets a nice half page of lore in the monster manual. Long ago, there existed a dread vampire named Golthius who worked fell magics and otherwise was a villain of the land. A hero eventually slew Golthius and drove a wooden stake into his twisted heart. Years later, a monstrous plant growth sprouted from that stake and a mad druid took this sapling and planted it in a forlorn grotto where it grew into a dark tree called the Golthius Tree. This tree is essentially the progenitor of all blights and has spawned other such trees and different lesser forms of blights such as the twig blight here. It is a nasty, spiteful little creature that resembles a dead shrub. It is an incredibly simple creature with just a basic claw attack and a will to spread malice and to harm life. Blights cannot speak, but they do have a rudimentary understanding of the common language and a tiny bit of intelligence. More than an animal, but rarely more than an ogre. Just a tiny sliver above the twig blight is the needle blight, which is a bit bigger at medium size, and instead of just clawing in melee, it can also throw needle spikes at a range. Both the twig blight and the needle blight are very simple creatures. Really, it's their creepy, menacing style and their interesting lore that puts them just above the lower tiers. And now we come to the myconids, starting off here with the myconid sprout. They're a kind of intelligent fungus. They walk about with vaguely humanoid forms, and they have goals and behaviors, so in a way we can consider them a kind of people. They do not speak, nor do they have mouths, but they communicate through spores that provide a kind of organic telepathy. They're sort of hive creatures, and they follow a very organized and structured way of life. Generally, they are conscientious, dutiful, and peaceful, and they often deal with or help adventurers who approach them in a non-threatening way. A myconid colony centers around a sovereign, which is a larger and stronger variety. The myconids often commune together, connecting through a dream-like hallucination brought on by the sovereign's special spores. This group meditation is called a meld, and it represents a convergence of entertainment, socialization, and spirituality. The myconid sprout is a young and lowly form of myconid, a CR0 specimen that has very little in terms of combat abilities. Like all myconids, if a sprout is damaged, it releases distress spores and all other myconids within 240 feet of it can sense its pain. Also, like all myconids, sunlight severely affects the sproutling, weakening it, and if exposed for an hour or more in direct sunlight, it dies. Myconids are a pretty interesting monster, I have to say. They definitely represent a kind of creature that could have been illustrated or shown in an immature way or a goofy way, but fortunately the 5e monster manual kept them serious enough. In fact, they are one of the very few creatures in 5th edition to receive full page art. There isn't even a dragon that gets this treatment. Mazes and myconids, hmm, has a nice ring to it. 
Getting back to the blights, we now have the vine blight, which is slightly stronger than the needle blight. It does have a major drawback in that its speed is a paltry 10 feet, but it has two effective abilities, a restraining vine constriction melee attack and an entanglement area, much like the entanglement spell. It sprouts up centered on the vine blight and it holds onto non-plant creatures, locking them in place. The ideal setup for a low-level blight encounter is the characters stumbling unwittingly upon a vine blight, which entraps them while needle blights assail them with those thorn attacks from a range, gaining advantage due to the adventurers being restrained. Finishing out the cycle of blight creatures is the aforementioned tree blight, which is actually found not in the monster manual but in the Curse of Strahd module. It hates other tree blights, and even more so, Treants, but it allies with other lesser forms of blights in their evil-natured will to dominate woodlands and slay people and animals of all kinds. At CR7, the tree blight is much stronger than the lesser blights, and it is able to attack with a branch, a grasping root, and a bite all in one turn. That said, I ran the numbers on the tree blight because they looked a bit low to me, particularly its AC and hit points, and according to the official 5th edition monster design rules, it is actually a CR5 monster. Its offensive capabilities are those of a CR7 monster. It's able to deal an average of 44 damage per round, and with an attack bonus of plus 9 to hit. But its defensive stats are those of a mere CR3 monster, with a fairly mediocre AC 15, and 92 hit points. There aren't any other factors that would raise its effective defensive stats. It has false appearance, being able to seem just like a dead tree when it's motionless, and the siege monster trait, meaning that it deals extra damage to objects and structures. It has a completely average speed of 30 feet, and blindsight of 60 feet, though blind beyond that radius. So nothing that would really influence its combat abilities for the better. So yet again, we see 5e provides us an underpowered monster. What a bummer. In high C tier comes the Kelpie, which is a neutral evil plant creature with a good amount of potential that unfortunately does not get fully realized. It is an aquatic plant monster, which as its name indicates, has a kelp-like or seaweed-like body. It swims decently fast, though it's very slow on land. It can form itself into the shape of a humanoid or a beast, giving it a deceptive appearance, though if viewed up close or in bright light, it's clear to see that the thing is made of plant clusters. It is a somewhat intelligent creature, and it can speak, common and sylvan, so right there we have the makings of a trickster-type monster. Aha. In melee combat, it attacks with powerful slams, and they deal impressively high amounts of damage. 2d8 plus 2 bludgeoning per slam on just a medium-sized creature. The slam also grabs hold of the target on a hit, though the Kelpie's most signature feature is its drowning hypnosis, a charm effect that works very similar to a harpy's song. It makes the affected creatures approach it in a stupor where they presumably go to their doom. The disappointing part of this ability is that the DC is so low it's just 11, just like the aforementioned Sirens, and also the Yellow Musk Creeper. A charmed creature repeats the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, and it also repeats the save anytime it takes damage from a source other than the Kelpie. Once it breaks free, it becomes immune to drowning hypnosis for 24 hours. It's a powerful, iconic effect even but the low DC means it probably won't be very effective. The other shortcoming with the Kelpie is that it has no lore. The creature appears in the 5e remake of the classic adventure White Plume Mountain. It's featured in the anthology book Tales from the Yawning Portal. Its bestiary entry provides zero lore about the Kelpie, and the dungeon area in which the Kelpies dwell does not describe anything beyond them just lurking in the water seeking to slay the adventurers. There's a lot that could have been done with the Kelpie, considering that they are sapient, talking beings that can take on all kinds of appearances, but they just didn't get fully fleshed out in 5th edition. 
Continuing through high C tier, we come across the Artuk Warrior from the Spelljammer setting. This unique race is composed of intelligent plant creatures that have bodies resembling a cross between fungus, starfish, and octopuses, all covered with a bark-like natural hide. Their heads can extend and retract, popping out from the bodies to lash with this long sticky tongue that grapples a target and pulls it in close. They also attack with spiky, suctioning branch arms and radiant pellet spits. Mm -hmm. Their limbs allow them to spider climb, which provides some fantastic mobility and another dynamic dimension to the combat encounter. Particularly if these are featured at low or low to mid tier levels, that could be quite a challenge and make the characters have to change their tactics to some degree. Lore wise, the Artux are a curious race. Their homeworld was destroyed by beholders. The scattered bands of survivors were banished to the material plane, though some of them managed to then go on and hijack or steal spelljammer astral vessels, which they pilot as they go about their plots for conquest and plunder and whatever else. They are a lawful evil race and have little compunction about hurting others to accomplish their goals. They speak their own language, Artuk, which sounds like crackling, popping, and hissing. I'm overall pleased with how the Artux were adapted into 5e. The warrior here is basically the baseline version of this monster. The Artuk priest and the elder are coming up in just a bit. At the top of C tier is the Myconid adult. Take everything we already knew about the Myconid from the Sprout entry, improve its overall statistics, give it a thrice per day ability called Pacifying Spores. The name, by the way, is misleading. A creature that fails its con save is not just pacified, but completely stunned for a minute, repeating the save to regain control at the end of each of its turns. The DC is pretty low, it's only 11, but for a CR one half monster, this ability could potentially spell disaster for an adventurer who got on the Myconid's bad side. That takes us through C tier. Some nice creatures, not without their flaws though, and in some cases frustratingly so. But as we've seen before, that's just the way things go in the old Dungeons and Dragons. Kicking off B tier is the Wood Woad, a creature which I have a particular fondness for due to my liking of it during the 3.5 era. It comes from one of my very favorite 3.5 books, Monster Manual 3 which I did a video on regarding some fantastic monsters that I wish would make a comeback. Due to my love of Monster Manual 3, I cannot help but view the 5e Woodwode in a contrast. And I have to say, it's really a mixed bag. I much prefer the look and the art of the 3.5 Woodwode. Its texture is so great and it has an almost humanoid look, muscular. Its expression is menacing and foreboding striking that great balance between dark and light. I also like the look of its club and its shield better. There's just more weight to everything. The 5e Woodwode looks like something out of World of Warcraft or a kid's cartoon. Its club looks kind of weak and its shield is awkwardly growing out of its left arm in place of a hand. What if it needs two hands to accomplish some kind of task? There are many things for which you need both your hands. By the way, this is not a knock against the artist. Just to be clear, the art talent is very high. Rather, it's criticism against the art direction. Overall, the 5e Woodwode just looks smaller, skinnier, weaker. It loses that tough, intimidating presence of the 3e one. The lore has also changed. Whereas the previous Woodwode were their own race, sort of a distant cousin to Treants, now the Woodwode is created from a dark druidic ritual in which a willing subject is sacrificed, has his heart cut out, a special magical seed planted into the heart, then the heart planted into the hollow of a tree or a stump, and the corpse buried amongst the roots of said tree or stump. After three days, a sprout grows from that spot, and it quickly grows into a Woodwode. It is an intelligence creature, it speaks sylvan, though it doesn't have much free will in 5th edition. It essentially carries out whatever orders from the druid or fey group that perform the ritual. Generally speaking, this includes defending a woodland area, 
or some site of importance to the druids or the fey. The Woodwode has always been fairly neutral in this area, with the potential to be either an enemy or an ally of the party, depending upon the circumstances. There are also the situations in which a Woodwode outlives its master or leader, which is a very plausible occurrence due to the fact that it is essentially immortal, almost a kind of plant lich, though to a much lesser degree of power. So this new lore actually is fairly interesting. It gives us something more unique than the original, which didn't give a whole bunch in fact. So which one's better, the dark druid ritual that turns a person into a woodwode, or the woodwode being their own actual race? It's sort of a toss up for me. Both have their pros and their cons, so you decide for yourself. In combat, the woodwode has tree stride, essentially teleporting from tree to tree like a dryad can. It is fairly stealthy, and the strikes from its club deliver quite a wallop. It has no ranged capabilities, which will inevitably lead to its downfall against player characters. And sadly, it is lacking the signature warp wood magical ability from 3.5, which was effective at messing up player weapons, shields, and spellcasting staffs. I wish the 5e remake of this monster would have been a bit better, but all things considered, it isn't bad. Next up are the Bridesmaid of Zuktmoy and the Chamberlain of Zuktmoy, found in the 5e module Out of the Abyss. I'm including them together because they are really about the same place in this ranking and they do operate together. The Bridesmaid, as its name suggests, is a vaguely humanoid shaped fungus creature serving the demon queen Zugtmoy, who is the legendary patroness of fungus and vermin. In this module, Zugtmoy plans to wed, quote unquote, herself to Aramaikos, the largest fungus being in existence. Once she unites with this colossal life form, she will come to dominate a large portion of, if not all of, the Underdark, transforming it into an extension of her layer of the Abyss. The characters, along with allied Myconids, seek to thwart this plan, and Zuktmoy's long-standing rival demon lord Jublex also seeks to ruin her corrupt mockery of a wedding. The Chamberlain of Zuktmoy is a large-sized creature and resembles fungus or big mushrooms. The Bridesmaid monster itself is pretty cool. It can magically warp between large mushrooms and areas of fungus, again similar to how a dryad can tree stride. It can use a Chamberlain of Zugtmoy as one of these warping points, by the way. The Bridesmaid's abilities include hallucination spores that can incapacitate a target, and a burst of infestation spores that radiate from the Bridesmaid, inflicting the targets with the disease known as Madness of Zugtmoy. This imparts indefinite madness flaws, which are quite interesting, assuming a player is able to roleplay them effectively. If the character fails three saving throws against the disease, it overwhelms him and his body reanimates using the dull and flavorless spore servant template that we covered earlier. The Chamberlain of Zuktmoy attacks with basic slams, and once per day it can release a cloud of infestation spores, much the same as the Bridesmaids. Also, whenever it takes damage, it releases toxic spores and all creatures adjacent must succeed on a con save or become poisoned for a minute, with a poisoned creature repeating the save at the end of its turns. So these are both pretty cool monsters. I quite like how they work together, how they serve an interesting role in the story, and how their spores can impart madness with effects found on a special random table and it can even end up turning a character into a kind of fungus zombie, should things go that far. Building onto the baseline of the Artuk Warrior are the Artuk Priest and Artuk Elder. The Priest is the same CR as the Warrior too, and it can cast Revivify and Tongues once per day, which means that it can bring back a recently slain ally to life at one hit point, even in the midst of battle, and it can communicate with the characters in common or whatever other language. As well, the priest can end the charmed and frightened conditions on its allies within 30 feet once per day. So these aspects increase its range of abilities and its role-playing potential beyond just the baseline warrior. The Artuk Elder, surprisingly, is only CR3, just one higher than the warrior. It is much bigger, actually large size instead of medium, and it's much stronger, which greatly improves its branch attacks. 
It also has some innate spells, once per day being able to cast Calm Emotions, Detect Magic, and Sending. The artwork of the Elder shows a couple of neat details, one being that its face slash head portion is retracted, and the other being the triple pseudopod digits extruding like fingers from one of its suction cups. What a weird race, these Artux. I'm not the biggest fan of Spelljammer, but these guys are most curious. At CR8, the Corpse Flower is on the high end in terms of powerful plants, with CR9 being the highest CR of all the official 5e plant monsters. In fact, I considered this when designing my 5e book, Esper's Emporium of Esoterica, and I made sure to include a couple higher level tree folk, the Grandmother Willow and the Sylvan Lord. Anyhow, the Corpse Flower is actually one of the coolest plant monsters, and a lot of people speak highly of it. It is chaotic evil and slightly intelligent due to the fact that a corpse flower grows from the grave of a necromancer or maybe the buried remains of a powerful undead. It is a giant mobile flower that exudes an overpowering stench of rot and attacks with poisonous tendrils. It carries humanoid corpses within its mass, which it digests in order to heal itself, or it releases them as allied zombies. It has some similarities with the yellow musk creeper in this way. It's not the deepest plant monster, but certainly far from the shallowest. It has an awesome aesthetic that blends the theme of big carnivorous plant monster with zombies, and it has enough storytelling potential to be featured predominantly in an adventure. At last we come to the Treant, the tree people of D&D who are inspired by the Ents from Tolkien's Middle Earth. Treants begin as normal trees, but they have a special quality to them that means they will one day awaken, developing into thinking, sapient beings. This is usually due to magic infusing the area in which the tree grows, and druids often protect and tend to trints while they are in their developing stage, which lasts for decades, even centuries. Once the treant becomes a creature, a face forms on its trunk, its roots form into feet-like appendages, and its lower branches come into place as arms. Treants are fully realized intelligent beings, and thus they have personalities, and motivations of their own, though there are some common characteristics that they share, such as a need to protect their woodlands from those who would destroy carelessly, or who would harm the forest and its denizens on an excessive scale. Treants are also chaotic good, that makes them wild and impulsive, yet with an inclination towards morality and an opposition to evil. Mechanics-wise, their attack options are pretty simple, with slam attacks and thrown rocks that both deal a substantial amount of damage due to its huge size. Once per day, it can animate two trees, which serve as allies, and quite potent allies, as they have the same stats as a treant, except they can only make a single slam attack and they can't animate other trees. Overall, the treant abilities are pretty simple. It's a big brute creature that makes powerful slam attacks, though it's a good candidate for a DM to add one or two additional abilities, or perhaps a few innate spells to spice things up. The Treant is a classic creature, and really such a staple of plant creatures. I wish I could rate it higher, but as I've said a hundred times, I'm only rating the actual content presented in the books, not the potential of what a DM could do with his own homebrewing or modifications. I should also take a moment to mention the Treant Sapling, which is found in the Wild Beyond the Witchlight module. It is part of the Witchlight Carnival, a whimsical fey carnival that comes and goes, even flying away if needed, by way of fantastic fairy wings that can sprout from its NPCs and animals. The Treant Sapling is a younger and large-sized Treant at CR2 instead of CR9. This does break the established lore of the Treant that they have to develop for many decades or centuries as a tree before they finally emerge as the powerful treant. But hey, in a world of fantasy and magic, anything is possible, right? Well, yes, in a way. You see, there needs to be some kind of backstory or reason as to why you are breaking the established laws of the fictional world. 
Otherwise, things just start to feel like nonsense. It's all so arbitrary. You see, with fantasy, and especially the very high magic fantasy, things are already so fantastical that if you don't balance them out with logic, reality, and consistency, the whole thing just feels immature and shallow. It feels like Calvin Ball. Now, I do understand that not all players care about this, but there's also a lot of players that really do care about this, and I'm going to make a comparison here. The first few seasons of Game of Thrones felt grounded, realistic, and had internal consistency. This contributed to the show being so amazingly good, and it allowed the more fantastical or supernatural elements to be special and to be believable. The later seasons abandoned logic and were wildly inconsistent, and that hurt the show so badly. We see the same thing with the Lord of the Rings films versus the Hobbit films. The original trilogy was grounded, historically inspired, and with a few exceptions it maintained its consistency. The Hobbit trilogy has video game-like sequences, Spider-Man, acrobat dwarves, CGI goblins and orcs instead of real actors in costumes, numerous other problems that prevent us from taking it seriously, from remaining in the immersion, and these things greatly harm the quality and the depth. The same thing happened to Star Wars, it happened to many other franchises, and I fear the same thing is happening with D&D. I can handle this treant. It is a little bit cartoonish, but it also has a classic aesthetic in a way. But it's hard to handle this treant, which goes full on cartoon, complete with strapped on fairy wings, and it breaks the established lore without any good explanation as to why. I'm sure plenty of people find it cute, they think it's funny, it doesn't matter, but to me, it just strikes me as a cheap gimmick. Anyhow, let's move on. In upper B tier is the Myconid Sovereign, a bigger, stronger, more intelligent, and more flexible kind of Myconid. Honestly, I expected this creature to be higher than merely CR2, and it comes off as more powerful both in the lore and in the kinds of things it can do. It builds upon what we know from the baseline Myconid Sprout and Adult, except it can use that stunning pacification spores at will. Also, it is the one who produces the hallucination spores, which it not only uses for the communal melds, but also in combat, which it can use to incapacitate targets. Also, three times per day, it can create a spore servant from a corpse via its animating spores. The Myconid Sovereign really is a great creature, one that leads to all kinds of potential for storytelling, adventure, and even world building. I would have loved to have gotten a sidebar or a bit of lore that described the hallucinatory meld from an immersed perspective. There's so much that could have been done with the Myconids. That's it for B tier. We're running out of plant monsters to rank. I wish it weren't this way, but this is what we have to work with. Going on into A tier, mid A tier in fact, we find an obscure monster from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft the body taker plant. Scholars disagree on whether this huge plant monster originated from somewhere beyond the stars or from somewhere in the depths of the Underdark. It communicates in both deep speech and telepathy and is sort of part plant, part aberration. If it's not already obvious to you, this creature is taken straight out of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. So the Body Snatch, I mean taker, is a rather slow creature but it can lash out to 20 feet with three vine tendrils that deal slashing damage and restrain the creature they grapple. It can then pull the grabbed creature into its interior pod where the victim dies of levels of exhaustion over hours, at which point it dissolves away and a podling spawns from the body taker plant. The podling, while it is a plant, almost perfectly resembles the digested creature. Almost perfectly, for it has a tendency towards subtly unnatural behavior. In fact, the entry even gives a table of some different example behavior flaws that can potentially give the podling away. What's more, 
The Body Taker plant can see through and telepathically communicate with any of its podlings out to a range of 10 miles. If the Body Taker plant is slain, its minuscule root filaments remain in the ground and allow it to regrow after some months. It is possible to prevent this regrowth, but you have to thoroughly salt or poison the ground. While the Body Taker plant's description refers to it as a malicious entity that views itself as the superior life form in its given ecosystem, the stat block strangely provides no alignment. It seems neutral evil, and I must wonder why that information is missing in an official capacity. What I love about this creature, other than its grisly and hair-raising habits, is that it leads to so much role-playing and storytelling. It prompts the DM to utilize podlings as imposters in a given scenario, and the player characters, through social interactions, will sooner or later start to pick up on odd mannerisms of the NPCs. And that's actually it for the Plant Monsters of D&D 5th Edition. There are some others that I left out, such as the Groth, but they don't really add anything that's new or different than we've already seen here. They would really just end up serving as filler in an already unexpectedly long video. So there's only a single A-tier plant and no S-tier plants. I'm really disappointed by that. In fact, I have an idea. Why don't I go over a plant creature from my book and explain why I think it's S-tier? So here we go, let's do this. In mid S tier, we have the Grandmother Willow from Esper's Emporium of Esoterica. Beautiful violet tresses hang from the willow. The trunk bears the face of a wizened woman with eyes that must have seen the triumphs and tragedies of many long years. The Grandmother Willow is a rare kind of elder tree folk or tree spirit that dwells near water. She is a maternal support figure, providing defense, wisdom, and storytelling for a forest community, and she also spends time alone when she sings her songs of tragedy and lament by the water's edge. Sorrow is a sibling of love, and as a mother's heart holds immense love for her children, she must also endure immense grief as her offspring suffer through the hardships of life. There is even a short poem included that expresses this aspect of her lore. The falling leaf was once a flower, a golden child with endless hours. His coat burns orange once the sun has spent. On scarlet wings drifts the great descent. So the mother watches her grown son stumble. So the world sees the high king humbled. Autumn's caress draws night over day, a fleeting dream of summer's last ray. Mechanically, the Grandmother Willow has a large array of features. Characters who listen to her stories during a rest often recall forgotten memories, which grants them advantage on ability checks to recall information or lore. Her rooted trait prevents her from getting shoved around or knocked over, so long as she's in contact with a solid surface. Her violet leaf tresses give her and all allies within five feet of her magic resistance, advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. She has a powerful two-slam multi-attack and a special ability called Grief Comes to All, which is a recharge six feature. She speaks magical words of lament, and each creature within 60 feet that can hear her must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or suffer disadvantage on all attack rolls and a negative 30-foot penalty to speed. These effects last for a minute, with the target repeating the save at the end of each of its turns. Though if it accumulates a total of three failures, it becomes charmed and cannot take hostile actions for 24 hours. And of course, the spell casting. The Grandmother Willow casts as though a 13th level druid with such spells as Entangle, Cure Wounds, Conjure Woodland Beings, and Wall of Thorns as well as some new spells from the Emporium, the Cantrip Water Lash, second level Shackle to the Earth, which stops a target from flying, climbing, and jumping, third level Rune of Binding, an area effect that can shut down enemy offense, and the seventh level Force of the Woodlands, which conjures up a thicket of trees, briars, and vines that harm and restrain the enemies within. Along with the poetic lore, the arsenal of potent and stylish abilities, and the wonderful role-playing potential, 
The Grandmother Willow has some beautiful art done by Ian Sibujano, which combines aspects of the weeping willow and the wisteria tree and portrays a grandmotherly face that is both tender with feminine nurturing and hardened from the grief of life's hardships. That is how you make a fantastic plant creature. Thank you very much. If you are curious about the Emporium, visit esperthebard.com or follow the link below. And please do not forget to check out my new Kickstarter for the grand adventures of Labyrinthine Gardens. Your support means so much to me, and I hope to keep making content of all kinds for a long time to come. This is Esper. I'm wishing you inspiration on your saving throws against the thorns in your side, the alluring pollen of deadly temptations, and the choking vines that hold you back from reaching your goals. As always, may your adventures be many. <laughs>